Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We'll just take a few moments while we're waiting for everybody to join from all around the country. Welcome, as you're joining us, maybe share in the chat room where you're joining us from and uh, what the weather's like there. I'm in Newcastle and it's been a bit overcast and rainy today. I didn't get out for my walk this morning. It's freezing in Adelaide. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> oh, lovely Tasmania and Sydney, Gippsland, chilly in Melbourne, absolutely. Looks like it's pretty cold and rainy around everywhere. Has anybody got nice weather? Uh, sunny in Perth, but cold. Cool, but sunny in Ballarat. Lovely. Thank you, everybody, for joining us from all around the country today. It's fantastic to have you here. I'll just take a few more minutes as people join. Sunny in Gippsland and beautiful in Townsville. Sunny in Canberra as well. How lovely. Freezing in Gosford. I feel you, Fiona. It's pretty cold here in Newcastle as well. Lovely. So thank you for joining us, everybody. We're just waiting for, for the rest of the participants to join us. Someone suggested perhaps I could moonlight as a weather person. Absolutely, I'm really open to anything. <laughs> uh, wow, we've got someone joining us from India. Welcome. It's fantastic. I didn't realise that we were stretching beyond Australia with this um, webinar today. Fantastic. Some people would like a bit more rain around the state. Someone's just asked, what time is it in India? So we'll just wait a couple more minutes as people are still joining us. It's 9.30 in the morning in India. There you go. Anybody else from further afield who are joining us today? Outer Eastern Melbourne, welcome. <laughs> hey, we've got someone from New Zealand. Hi, Sharon. Narrabri, lovely. Or someone from Kathmandu there too. Oh Chris. gosh, I didn't see that one. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Yes, so this webinar is being recorded. Someone just asked in the chat box. Okay, so I think that we will get started. At the moment, we've got 293 participants. Not sure how many more we're going to be expecting, but we'll get started because we've got a lot of interesting content to get through today. So thank you for joining us in this webinar series, Expert Insights for Workplace. My name is Dr. Chris Kafer, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm a clinical psychologist and part of the education team at the Black Dog Institute. And in my role, I help develop and facilitate programs for workplaces and health professionals. When I'm not working with the Black Dog Institute, I'm working as a clinician in a private practice. And I'm really excited to be part of this discussion today. I'm hoping to learn a lot myself. So as we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today. Uh, we're all joining from, from all over the place. Um, it's the Wabakal people for me because I'm joining from Newcastle. I'd like to pay my respect to Elders both past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us today. Uh, 
um, as we've all experienced, Australian workplaces have had to rapidly adapt and reassess the way we work in an unprecedented way in response to COVID-19. This change along with job uncertainty is causing understandable concern and anxiety among workplaces at all levels. And at the Black Dog, we've been inundated with calls from organisations for assistance to help guide them through this period. And this webinar series is in response to this. It's an opportunity for organisations to ask the burning questions they have, to listen to experts and to hear from our researchers and hear the strategies that other organisations are implementing during this challenging time. Today, we'll be focused on supporting the mental health of your team during uncertainty. And the second in this series will address building your team's resilience to cope with change and uncertainty. While this series has been prompted by COVID-19, the information presented will also be relevant for other periods of uncertainty and change. So let me introduce you to our panel of experts. So with me are Associate Professor Sam Harvey. Sam is the Chief Psychiatrist at the Black Dog Institute and an Associate Professor at UNSW. And Sam runs the Black Dog Institute's clinical services, as well as a program of research which links work and mental health. Sam has advised many organisations, governments and the World Health Organisation in how the best available research can be used to create more mentally healthy workplaces. Thank you for joining us today, Sam. Lovely to be here. I'd like you also to introduce you to Marion Spencer. She's Head of Operations, People and Culture at the Black Dog Institute. Marion has over 20 years experience and has a strong focus on staff engagement and developing positive workplace culture. Marion has translated findings from the Black Dog Workplace Mental Health Research into a mental health and wellbeing framework. And this won the 2019 Alan Fells Mental Health Award and has led to the Black Dog Institute being voted as a great place to work repeatedly through the Employee Choice Awards. Marion cares, pa cares passionately about people and the planet. She believes in authentic leadership and treating people and their welfare amongst the highest business priorities. Thank you for joining us today, Marion. Thank you. And let me introduce you to Peter Ferreira. Peter is a specialist management consultant and executive coach at EQ. Uh, which provides facilitation and coaching services. Peter has over 20 years experience facilitating workshops and providing one-on-one -on -one executive coaching and counselling for his clients. Industries include construction and mining, manufacturing, financial services, transport and logistics, aviation and health. Peter also volunteers with the Black Dog Institute, sharing his first-hand experience with family members, clients and business colleagues who suffered from mental health issues. Peter's on a quest to improve people's understanding of mood disorders and removing the stigma associated with it. With it. Thank you for joining us today, Peter. Thank you for having me. So a great panel and we've got some great questions to throw at the panel today. Today we're going to be discussing the impact on mental health of the COVID-19 pandemic and what workplaces can do to support staff and offset the impact. Uh, so when you, when you registered, people submitted questions. We're going to get through as many of these as we can and also any questions that you choose to share in the chat box. So let's get started. So Sam, what is the impact of COVID-19 on our mental health? It's a really, it's a mixed bag is the honest answer is what we're seeing so far and, and let me be the, the, the first to use the word that I'm sure will get repeated a couple of times and which everyone's already sick of in terms of saying it's all a bit unprecedented. And um, one of the, you know, what we're seeing at the Black Dog is a real, is a mixed bag. There, there's a few people who sort of are feeling it's not having that much of an impact on them, but actually for the majority of people, it's having an impact and a negative impact. And, and what we're seeing even though our face-to-face -face clinics and our emergency departments are, if anything, having less people come through them, we're getting an absolute surge in people using our online resources, um, anywhere from two to 300% increase. So it's creating a lot of anxiety and a lot of distress out there. And that's what we're seeing coming through on the website. Really, 
there are three groups that we're particularly worried about, and I'll, I'll list them, and I know we'll come back and chat about some of them later, but there's a big group of people with existing mental health problems or, or low-level anxiety or depression problems that are getting a massive surge in their symptoms at the moment and are struggling to know where to get help for about that because a lot of the normal pathways are shut down or at least reduced. There's a big group of workers who COVID has caused a big change in the way their work's happening or additional strain on, on their work. And we can talk about what some of those groups are. And then of course, there's a, there's a sadly, probably an equally large group who what COVID is causing is a real threat to their job security. And in some unemployment, in others, just a, a great deal of uncertainty about the future. And we've got ample research at the impacts that that has on mental ill health, on rates of suicide, on well-being, on domestic violence, a whole range of, of different outcomes that come from that. Yeah, thank you. And, and Peter, you know, what are you hearing and seeing in the organisations that, that you're working with? Does that align with what Sam was saying? Yes, um, very much so, Chris. I'm seeing it across industries at the moment, um, a range of responses from some people that, that loves it, that, that, that adjusted to it very quickly, and other people on the other spectrum actually suffering from anxiety. Uh, it's a young engineer um, in, a, in a session not so long ago, and she's got um, three young children, pre and primary school age, plus her husband and herself at home. And she's, she's, she was actually what Sam's referring to there, suffering from borderline anxiety. Um, and also I did just, just two days ago, I, um, I got people in a Zoom um, conference, uh, for, uh, leadership program was running, I got them to respond. I just said to them, how are you feeling right now before we start this leadership session? Just type in one or two words in the, in the chat box. Um, and then here's some of the words that came up. Busy, acceptance of the situation, tired, motivated, optimistic, adjusting, stressed, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can hear from those adjectives, there's a range. Um, so people are impacting differently. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. And, and does that fit, Marion, with what you've seen at the Black Dog Institute among staff? Marion, you're muted at the moment. Sorry about that. I stumbled at the first hurdle. Um, <laughs> <You're> here <now. laughs> I'm here now. I was just, I reiterate the sort of the huge diversity that Sam was referring to. And I think initially it was, it, there was, the impact was really significant because, I mean, normally there's a lot of uh, strategy and planning that goes into managing change in the workplace because we know people don't like it. It upsets them and it stresses them out. But when COVID came along so very quickly and brought that change with it so very, very rapidly, uh, I think in, in the first instance, people were very stressed. Now the time's passed and the, the drastic change and the rate of change has kind of slowed down a bit. I think I'm finding the impact amongst our cohort or our demographic anyway um, has, has settled down with that and and really the difference is depending on people's different circumstances We've got a huge range of different demographics you know that sort of some people have their own private office at home some people have flatmates and they're sitting at the kitchen table uh, so that really impacts how people are finding it um, we we know the people who've had who've got kids and have been trying to do homeschooling and and uh, balanced childcare with working from home have had a really difficult, stressful time. Um, we surveyed our staff and we found that 48% of them were still feeling socially isolated, sort of five weeks into it, and some were feeling lonely. But then strangely, we haven't, we haven't seen an increase in calls to our EAP, um, but we do have the benefit, I think, of having a staff who are fairly mentally uh, literate and we I'm thankful that 99% of our staff in the survey said they, they kind of know how to stay safe and healthy. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I, I agree with everything that's been said already, but my biggest takeaway from it has been that huge variation in how people are being impacted. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And Sam, are there some workplaces or workers that are more at risk at this stage of, of negative mental health impacts? Yeah, look, there's, there's broadly speaking three groups that we're concerned about. Um, there's a group of individual workers that we know 
are at increased risk because of what's going on. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that clinically we're seeing a lot of people who have always probably been someone who errs on the side of, of being a worrier, having some health anxieties, and, and then this is creating a perfect storm for them where there is a, a massive health risk that they're being constantly reminded of and they're being forced to sit at home and think about nothing else. So I think, you know, that we can define a group of individual workers in any organisation that, that, that we should be concerned about at the moment. I think at more of an organisation level, there's two types of organisations that we're particularly concerned about at present. One is I think there are whole industries where the, the risk profile of the work they're doing, at least in the perception of it, has really changed. And, and in a way, the two most obvious examples of that are healthcare workers and teachers. Um, we've got a lot of research around healthcare workers who've been through previous pandemics, you know, the healthcare workers that worked through the SARS pandemic in those countries. And we know, you know, we're going to see more than one in 10 healthcare workers come out of this with symptoms uh, looking like PTSD. Uh, we're going to see a big spike in levels of distress amongst them. I think teachers, the reality is we know much less about what we're hearing from a lot of those sort of industries is they went from, you know, most that they're not, they didn't sign up to doing a job that was considered high risk. Uh, and yet now they're being told that they're the first part of society going back to work. They're not getting adequate information about risk. I think we see a similar thing with retail workers. In, in, in my clinic earlier this week, I saw someone who worked at Bunnings and talked about how that the extra strain that they're under. So I think there's those industries where just there's been a big shift, and in particular a big shift in the, the level of risk that their workers perceive that they're under, and that's really important. And then the third group are the industry groups where, um, you know, the bottom has fallen out of their market and where you've got a group of workers that went from having good long-term secure jobs to now being uncertain whether they're going to have a job at the end of the year. And um, there is an abundance of research around the mental, you know, as much as people like myself talk a lot about the way in which workplaces can be good or bad for mental health, that the, the, the overwhelming reality is in general having work is good for your mental health and so now we've got a massive cohort of people that are facing the prospects of not having work and all of the unemployment financial social consequences of that and and we need to be thinking very carefully about how to support them yeah and um this question came in with one of the registrations is how would you know you know, within the team perhaps that you're managing, who's at risk or, or who might be having problems? Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, there's two broad things. One is you can try and predict who it might be. So, you know, we've already talked uh, about how two of the key things happening at the moment is change and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I think most managers will be able to think in their team, who are the people that normally cope with change well and who are the people that are always a little bit rigid around change? Um, who are the people that are prone to have, to be anxious and nervous? Who are the people who, who sort of are socially isolated, live by themselves? You know, I think they're the individuals to be worried about just sort of through that sort of risk assessment of what's going on. But in many ways, you know, the more sensible thing to do, because actually even, you know, the best psychiatrists in the world are in other ways very good at predicting these things. Um, you know, the real key is around observing for change and, um, you know, looking for the change, you know, being aware that this is a risk time for everyone and trying to look out for the signs of people who are struggling. And therein lies... The, the dilemma of the current situation, because normally when we teach managers about how to watch out for the signs of employers who, who are um, struggling, you know, we talk about looking for people who are taking more sick leave than normal. We talk about looking for people who are a bit more irritable, more agitated in meetings, who, who seem less interested at work, who all of those signs that actually now we're not in the same building of people, how are we meant to notice those things? And, and this is something we're trying to learn on the run about how can you be having these regular Zoom check-ins for people to see how they're doing. Um, and, and to be honest, I come back to one of the things Peter said at the start, actually, for, for all the pontificating of someone like me, 
actually probably about the best thing a manager can do is just to make sure they find the time to ask their people how you're doing and um and and, and you know people will uh, normally answer honestly yeah actually, and, if and I might just uh, land that point as well if you don't mind um, christine because this is relevant i just literally in the last week um was talking to an engineer and he admitted like he's very commercially focused. He told me he's very socially oriented, good person, but at work, he doesn't think about that aspect, never has. But what he's been doing now since COVID, he's put an, a, um, a regular agenda item on every meeting he does, virtual meeting, checking in with the team or the individual, just saying, how are you going? How are we going? What do you need from me? So just want to add to what Sam said. So people are adjusting. Yeah, and I guess people are having to adjust their management style and um, and become a little bit more involved in people's lives. You know, we're all Zooming and dialing in from home, so already we're becoming a little bit more involved in each other's lives, a bit different from how it usually rolls at the office. Was there anything you wanted to add to that, Marion? Yeah, I mean, I think I think generally we it's it's useful to try and foster a culture of help seeking, and mm -hmm. I think in it, by giving people different channels. Uh, and, and all our channels of communication are different at the moment, but there's, there's really simple ways that you can give people channels of communication for putting their hand up, making it okay for people to put their hand up and say, yeah, they could really do with some help. And there's always going to be that cohort of people who actually just don't though. So I think for a manager, monitoring who's not attending things, who's not joining in meetings, having a look at, yeah, who, who you haven't heard from for a while, seeing where the gaps are in, in your team and then making a pointed uh, attempt to perhaps reach out or find someone appropriate to reach out to that person. Yeah. Sammy, put your hand up. Chris, yeah. someone just, I was just sort of monitoring the chat and I think someone made a really good point there uh, that, that one of the best ways I think for managers to start that conversation about how people are coping is to admit the, the, the difficulties that they're having. Mm. Um, you know, a, yeah, a couple of weeks ago in a meeting with my team, I just sort of laid out the things that I was, I was finding very difficult and, and to try and make it okay to be talking about the things that are going well and the things that aren't going well, I think is a, a really useful thing. There is, there can be a bit of a sort of, you know, a hoorah Henry sort of approach within some teams of, that everyone's talking about how adaptive they are and how great it's going. And that's good. You should, we, we, we should sort of praise when we're doing well, but also make it okay to talk about the things that aren't going well. Yes, and, and unlike other events, you know, this is happening to all of us. And so it is a good opportunity to, to be able to share, look, this is how I'm coping. These are the things that I'm finding difficulty. And it's very normalising and validating, isn't it, to just start to have those conversations. Well, I'm going to do something controversial. I can see you're the MC. You can shut me off. But <laughs> when we sort of, before we got on live, Sam, you gave us a glimpse into your house. So do you mind panning to the, your left, I think? So people can look into your life. Look at that. A well-behaved child. Well, obviously, obviously, what I'm doing is I'm compromising my child's education for all your benefit. You're sitting <laughs> watching some pointless cartoon rather than doing her maths, but that's okay. She'll well, catch I think it, it, it humanizes us. I think, like you're a senior leader and a person in the industry, but you're a dad, and so so I think there's there's some good things come out of COVID through this forum. Where we're looking at the human being, not the title or the suit. It's a human being here, just like all of us, and normalizing. It's okay. We're all in the same boat. Um, I just want to add to that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and so I guess we're, we're getting the scope of what, how it's impacting on people. But, you know, what can workplaces do to support staff and offset the impact? Sam, do you want to start with what does the research tell us about what we can be doing? So... I think if we think about, you know, that one of the themes that's come through is just how much change is happening at the moment. And, you know, we do have research about how organisations can best deal with change. And we've also got good research about how organisations can deal with really challenging, distressing events, because we've got many organisations, first responders and other groups that do that. I think in terms of the change side of things, you, you know, the, the, in a way we've known the answer to that for a fair while. Actually, what's most important is leadership and communication and uh, 
people having a sense of control over what is happening um, and, and people having a voice in which to sort of, so we talk about this, this concept in research and, and increasingly in workplaces around, um, you know, job control or, or um, you know, the ability to which an individual feels that they have a sense of control over what they're being asked to do, the way they're being asked to do it, the resources, that, how they can use the resources that they have. And, and I think in these difficult times, you've really got to go back to those core principles and to say, okay, well, you know, we're now having to think about going back into the workplace. How can I involve my team in discussing how we do that? What are the things that they want in place before we do that? And making them feel part of, of that discussion. And, you know, to be honest, that feels like advice about how to be a decent, sensible person rather than mental health advice, but that's what really matters at this time. Um, beyond that, I think what it does give us an opportunity to do is to think more broadly about workplace mental health and, and that actually all the things that we know work in other situations will work here. You know, it's about making sure you've got an environment where people can ask for help. It's making sure that you've got leaders who understand their role in creating the work environment that helps and also responding when they see people struggling. And at times it's about giving the individuals resources to, to try and help themselves get through some of the challenges. And um, maybe I'll talk a bit more about some of those things when we come back to talk about some specific industry groups, but they would be my high level things. Yeah, and Marion and Peter, you know, how does that fit then in terms of in the, in the workplace? Yeah, I think, I think Sam hit on it. I think it's all about communications. I think having a really strong internal communication strategy is important, because I, I, but it needs to be strategic because I think people are finding the bombardment of information a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of new channels and they're all online. So I think letting people have regular information at times when they can expect it. So, um, but, but people keeping people connected and I think authentic leadership is really important. I think as touching on what Sam also said was that we're all going through this, whether you're a manager, an employee, an exec, actually just being authentic and honest about what it's like. Um, and so that there's a, that, so that there's an underlying message of empathy there in the, in the leadership. Um, and just uh, being creative on how you can create opportunities for people to connect with each other, uh, I, you know, ideas about people being socially connected, uh, being active um, and, and in, in implementing, if, if it suits your workplace, initiating you know, sort of strategies whereby people can do things together like online yoga classes at lunchtime or anything like that that sort of uh, gets people all uh, active and connected um, and building personal resilience really. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, what are your thoughts on, um, I guess, the role of managers at this time? Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to also just run off Sam and Marion's comments because that's my observation. One can do an industry, working across industries. And I'm seeing a varied, varied response as well. Um, some do it better than others. Some still trying to work it out. I uh, was actually um, in prepar preparation for, the, for today's webinar. I was cross-referencing what some of my clients doing to the framework for mental health and well-being developed by Marion. Um, and yeah, I, with some of my class, I can tick some of those things. Some of them I can tick more than others. So there's, a, there's an inconsistency um, with what I'm finding. But yes, I guess maybe six things that, that they can be doing, but the feedback I'm getting from my clients is one is to monitor people's physical and health risks, what we spoke earlier. And that, if you're in a leadership role, that's part of your work health and safety obligations anyway. Duty of care. It's a different environment as we know, but that duty of care is just as important. So that the second one is already mentioned, but is to communicate regularly with, with your employees about the steps the business is taking to address COVID on behalf of them. So what's happening in our business right now? How are we addressing it? The, the third point is to be open and transparent with employees about their job security. That's a theme that's coming out and out, and I'm seeing some of the chat box already. People are conscious of that. So, so be as open and transparent about that as we can. The next one is to stay in contact. Um, we have got the social tools now and virtual media as well. Um, and the, the, the other point that I've picked up is to, to prepare and continue to review a work from home strategy. 
So because this is actually creating new opportunities, a new new. Um, so as a leadership group, if you're a leader in a room, it's like, what, what opportunities give us now? Um, the other point I've got um, is to promote a positive, inclusive culture by setting up regular virtual, say, coffee meetings. So that inclusion, making feel people in the social sort of aspect still feel not marginalized because that's another feedback we get. People do feel isolated. Um, two more to go. Um, one is to en encourage a healthy work-life balance by setting time limits. That's feedback I'm getting. People are working longer and harder now because they at home, they and they actually fatigue um, land of Zoom or land of Teams. It actually mentally draining sit in front of a computer. So having boundaries around how to manage that. And uh, my final point um, that I've picked up is about educate, what managers can do is to educate staff on ways how they can stay mentally healthy by working from home. So all the tools and resources available there for that. So there's some six points or tips that, that managers can do that I've learned. Great. And, and for people, if you weren't sort of jotting down those six points, we will be sort of uh, developing a fact sheet after this uh, webinar to summarise some of the key points. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sam, are there sort of additional considerations for the, for the frontline staff that we sort of spoke about before, things that can be done to help sort of offset the impact? There are, and, and look, I noticed um, on the chat box, we've got quite a few people working in, in the school sector and, and, yeah. and the challenges there, and I'm sure there's some in the, um, in the retail sector as well that, that are, are feeling that their, their job is suddenly much, the, the risk profile of their job is different to before. Let me talk about the health sector a bit because we know a bit more about them and I think then we can think about how that knowledge can be sort of shared into other sectors. So if we look at the healthcare sector where, where healthcare workers have been through this type of thing, um, we know that you get, a, you know, the things that predict how likely an individual is to become mentally unwell after working through that is those people who feel they didn't get adequate information, those people who feel they weren't adequately protected, and, and those people that felt that they were being asked to do things that their superiors weren't being asked to do. Um, and, and so I think, in a way, they're lessons that can really be shared equally in other places. Um, and, you know, within the healthcare setting, you know, the, the, this issue of like personal protective equipment, that, that's what, what we've been saying to the health departments around Australia and elsewhere is that actually that's the best mental health intervention you can do. Um, so the question is, how does that then translate into, for example, into the classroom for teachers who are, who are having to go back? And I think... Um, you know, one thing is around consistency of information and, and you know, that's challenging for, for principals and other people in charge because obviously the politicians keep sort of changing their minds slightly about it. So, you know, uh, that makes it very hard to plan. But I think at least trying to make sure that you are getting as much information out to people with, with as much explanation as you're able to provide. You have to make sure that you've got the practical things in place to make them feel like, they are being protected as much as possible, you know, soap dispensers, all of that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the practical things around staggering start times, things like that, making sure that they are feeling that they are going to be adequately backed up, that if one of their students is looking unwell, that there is a very clear protocol that they just have to press a button and that someone will be escorting that child home, making sure they're looked after without creating too much panic. I think the other thing you've got to acknowledge is that is that there is some genuine anxiety and I don't think it's helpful to sort of to pretend that there's not reason to be anxious. I think what you need is to have an honest conversation that yes there is you know this is anxiety provoking. Here's what we think we can be doing to make sure that this is as safe as possible and we're looking after you. We want to know if there's other things that you think we should be doing. And by the way, it's okay to be feeling anxious. It's not your fault that all of this is happening. And here's the type of things that we're making available because we know that, that there are some particular things that, that can help us handle these things. Um, 
gosh, I feel that was quite a rambling answer and I can't quite recall where I started now, but perhaps I'll stop there. <laughs> um, that's great, Sam. Thank you. Um, Marion, I was just thinking about the, the black dog. There's been some additional things that have been added in that the staff have been accessing more widely now, isn't there, in terms of, you know, we know that there are evidence-based treatments for anxiety and workplaces can offer um, strategies to help people manage their anxiety because you're right, being anxious at this time is really normal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We, it's been very interesting, actually. We found whilst the um, calls to the EAP haven't changed, we've had a lot of people coming along to things like online mindfulness mm. um, and participating in um, s uh, Raw Mind Coach, which is an app for, uh, for helping people uh, build resilience. Um, we've had more people participating in those things online than we ever have done when we offered them in the building. Um, so I think, um, yeah, there's, there's been a bit more of an uptake in, in those sorts of tools and opportunities. Um, we've also, I think, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of surveying and giving people the opportunity to have their say, because I think when people are given the opportunity to say what they think or say what they feel or say where their anxieties lie and then see that people are listening to it and making uh, a, a just creating initiatives and strategies around that, I think that's really very helpful as well. Because I think when people are struggling with their anxieties or their fear or they're around things, but they just don't feel as though they're being heard or that there's anywhere for them to say that. So we've certainly been doing quite a few surveys. And again, we've had such a great uptake in them. I mean, normally we would get maybe 60% of people participate in a survey. We've had touching 90% of staff just really wanting to actually have that say and be involved, which is really useful because it gives us incredibly useful information um, on, on which to act. Um, Sam's got his hand up again. Sam, you're allowed to talk. I just wanted to follow on from that point of, of Marion around the types of resources people are going to. You know, one of the one of the interesting things about what we're seeing at the moment is like normally when I see people clinically with health anxiety and, and, and I'm sure just same with you, when, when you see people with health anxiety, it's been driven often by irrational thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, people feeling that their health is at risk when it's not really. And, and so a lot of what you do in those things is about challenging those assumptions and, and, and sort of trying to build in negative, uh, different automatic thought processes. But of course, this is different because, you know, a lot of these anxieties are rational and, and indeed everywhere you go for information is reinforcing the fact that this is rational. And so I think at the level, at a population level or within a workforce level, that has to influence what you do about it in that you, you sort of say, well, actually, we know why people are feeling anxious. It's understandable they're feeling anxious. Our role should not be to make you feel less anxious. What it should be is to give you some skills to handle that that additional anxiety we're all feeling, and and what we know works in those situations is practical things. So, things like those mindfulness skills work at an individual level, good leadership, physical activity, those sort of things are the things that we know work in these types of situations. Um, ironically, the place that we're really using some of the research from is some of the stuff that we've been doing in refugee camps in Syria and these types of places where people for a long time have had objective reasons to be very, very worried about what's going on with them. And, and you don't have much resources. And so what can, what are some of the basic skills you can teach people to handle that? And that's what we're trying to now transfer into this situation. And that'd be relevant to some of the questions and comments that are coming up in the chat box about uh, people in their roles where they're dealing with um, distressed general public or people that are, you know, we've heard from pharmacists who are receiving aggression from, from different customers. So it's, it's all of that stuff, isn't it, that, that these are the things that you're facing. What are the things that can be done to try and help you face those? And, and then what, how can your organisation support you? And certainly one of the things we're hearing is that people who are in community-facing roles uh, that there's been a real shift in the way that people are behaving towards other people when they're out and about, mm -hmm. that, that suddenly everybody is seeing another person as a threat and everyone's on edge. And, you know, it just makes everyone a bit more of an asshole. And, and so, it, you know, I think one of the things you've got to do is to think about, well, what's the impact of that and how can 
you know, how can I make sure my workforce is getting a chance to still be able to share that experience and to share ideas on how to handle that and to reassure themselves that this is not about them. This is what's something that everyone's noticing. Yeah, absolutely. Again, that sort of normalising, isn't it? And yeah, um, you know, what, what do we need to be aware of now as the, the COVID measures start to reduce and workplaces consider, you know, returning to face-to-face -face operations? Yeah, what are some of the mental health impacts? I, think, might need to I think we really need to be aware of the fact that a lot of people don't want to go back to the same as it was before. They don't, whether there's COVID or not, they've actually, there's a whole lot of things that have been happening and ways of working that people want to take with them into the future and that there are options here for positive change that we've sort of um, embraced over this short period of time. I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of people don't feel safe or comfortable to go back to work. And if you're in a, a, a workplace that doesn't need to have people actually in, in their roles in the building, then the, we should be being flexible and enabling people to stay working from home if that's where they feel the most comfortable and productive. And I think there's also a role for educating people around COVID and, and what, what it is and ha what, the, what the real risks are. Um, I've been looking for some resources and there's a few around, but I think before we bring all of our staff back, we'll potentially get everybody to do an online uh, sort of um, info session about COVID and the risks. There's a really good one on one of the Department of Health websites. It's mainly for health workers, but I did it the other day and it was really illuminating and it made me feel less anxious about uh, being out and about because I, I gave me a better understanding of how it's transferred and how you can catch it and what the risks are. Yeah, that sounds great, doesn't it? Because I, you sort of see this different uh, risk or threat perception. You know, some people are, are, are highly sort of aware of it and other people less so. And as managers, we're trying to sort of, you know, support both sets of people. So really decent psychoeducation around the risks. So yeah, because there's a lot of misinformation page. and, yeah. and yeah, confusion. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, flexibility around what that return looks like. I know, you know, a lot of people are very concerned about catching public transport and, you know, maybe once they get to work, they feel okay about it, but then their risks of getting to work are, are quite concerning. Mm. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel around yeah. how we manage this sort of return to whatever this new normal looks like? Before I touch upon that, I just think um, there's, a, there's a really interesting uh, chat going on in the side box around um, the... I guess sort of what we would sort of classify as that effort reward balance that, you know, normally when people are at work, A, people can see you're there working um, and, and, and B, you know, very often just in a side conversation you'll have with someone in your team, you'll say, hey, great job. Thanks for that type thing. What is happening now because people are working at home is a people don't see them working and so people sort of panic that 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 everyone thinks they're not working and i think there's a lot of people they're getting stressed and working even harder than usual to try and to generate that and also i think that the opportunity for feedback is much less and and so i think one of the things that managers need to be doing in amongst all this is kind of you know making sure they're aware of the work that people are doing and finding opportunities to mm -hmm. to sort of acknowledge that and, and to, to make people realise that in some circumstances they won't be able to get as much done at home as they have elsewhere and in other times they will. Um, I, I, I also, been... I also just want to clarify, I wasn't meaning to suggest that <laughs> the level of stress experienced by a teacher returning to work is the same as a, as a person in a refugee camp. What I was trying to say was that we can Sometimes you can learn from what works in those really extreme, horrific situations to understand what might work in other, not comparable, but situations that have some similarities, albeit at a different point along the scale. Absolutely. I just wanted to add a thing about um, trust. I think one of the things that's shifted quite specifically around working from home is I don't know, but a lot of people used to do that working from home mm. when we used to talk about it before and it was sort of like code for probably at the beach or, <laughs> you know, but actually I think that's changed. I think that over the last couple of months with everybody working from home, trust has, has been something that's been really uh, built uh, throughout 
management and organisations is people actually now trust that people are really working from home and, and productively. And if I may add to that, Marion, that I've had more than one client articulate that in the words, this is actually working. The people are still delivering. They're still meeting objectives, KPIs, targets, albeit in different formats. So, um, so it can be done. So that command and control model, perhaps this is beginning of the end of that. If I don't see you, you don't work because I don't trust you basically. So I think this is accelerated, that, which is a consideration for when people are coming back to work because particularly high performing um, people, um, be very careful. You may alienate them by one skin that I don't trust you must be here. So it's that communication that I think you spoke about earlier. Ask people. Uh, what's this opportunity? Ask what's going to best work for you and your circumstances. And if your organization can uh, have got that capability to be flexible, it needs to be listened to. But we do, um, you know, we need to find ways to make sure that people can switch off at the end of the day if they're working from home and all these other sort of things that I think we need to be giving people guidance about. Um, there's another interesting question that's popped up around you know, the issue of rational versus irrational anxiety, um, um, which I think was one that someone sort of put in before the, 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 the chat and it obviously relates to what I was saying. And it's a really fair point that I think, you know, if you get a group of 100 workers, then the vast majority of them, the anxiety they're feeling is rational anxiety. You can understand where that comes from. Within every workplace, there are people that that, we'll be having a level of anxiety about COVID-19 that, that doesn't stand up to rational challenge. And the question is what one does about that. Um, and, you know, I think there's a grading of responses to that. I, I think one of the things that we know really drives anxiety is avoidance. You know, you get into this cycle of where something makes you anxious, so you avoid it, and then the anxiety response is even greater. So one of the simple behavioural responses to anxiety provoking situations is that sort of graduated exposure. So in the case of COVID related anxiety in the workplace, you know, you accept that some people are going to be really anxious when they come back to work, but how can you gradually expose them to that situation in a way that's not overwhelming and which you can gradually sort of increase up from? And that will work for many people and that's just part of good planning, but there probably will be a proportion of people that it won't work for and this you know, what's happening at the moment becomes a precipitant to say, actually, you know, can we chat about how you can get some help for this and let me chat about things that we may be able to assist with there. Yeah, so it sounds like there are some things that workplaces can do, um, which will help a lot of people. And then there are additional services and su supports for people who might need a bit of extra assistance. And some of those would be, you know, whatever your organisation's employee assistance program is. Well, and I think, you know, some that there are those first steps are the most difficult ones. So, you know, the idea of, you know, get people back into the workplace, even if it's just for a, you know, a couple of hour meetings or things like that, just to begin to get them acclimatised to it and to see what are the issues that arise. There's quite a few comments on the chat line about um, public transport, though. And, and that's that's a real that's a real problem, I think, is, is you know, we've got we're not we've got a lot of people that come on public transport to work. Uh, so, I mean, I've got, we're, we're looking at carpooling, uh, but I think apart from sort of a couple of sort of small scale initiatives like that, I think if people are anxious about public transport, then they probably need to keep working from home if they can. Surely this is also going to be the thing that finally, that finally makes um, staggered starts and staggered finishes a reality. Yeah. Yeah, why don't they start high school students at 10 o'clock? It would be much easier in my house. <laughs> but actually, if I might too, if I might just add in terms of, because that's, that's now new for everybody, the, the coming back to um, the post-COVID world is, um, and once again, in a leadership role, it's about planning. It's about looking at a big picture. It's about understanding the organization. It's no, like, no, every organization is different. But like all the things that's been mentioned, like, you know, how are we going to make this happen? So all the brains to come together and talk about this and, and you know, talk about the concerns, you know, the good old SWOT analysis, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And then out of that drive some action. So, so a couple of just you know, points that once again, I might add here four or five. One is how are we going to manage access back to buildings and in lifts? 
How is that going to work? Um, another one is social distancing measures. How are we going to enforce that or make sure people adhere to that back in the workplaces? Um, cleaning protocols. Now, what are they? How are we going to communicate that? Um, and so forth. Um, things like um, communicating, consulting with people about this. Um, exactly. As I just had um, a conversation this morning with a, with a client. It's a program that they run for them. People actually fly in from all over Australia. And exactly that, Marian, um, concerns has been expressed about people not want to travel on public transport. So we're going to deliver the rest of this leadership program in a virtual format to recognize those people's concerns. Um, another one is retraining and reskilling because the world of work may be changing as a result of that. So this is part of the leaders of thinking, what are the new skill sets or competencies that our people now need? Um, and then obviously how to support them with mental health um, as part of the strategy. So it's, to me, it's a bit of a holistic approach, but my point, I guess, not just jump in and then hit and miss, is each organization is different. I respect that. But it's in, as a leadership group, you should know your culture, you should know your, your boundaries and your operating protocols is in how, how can we make this best? It's a bit like a change management process where we think about this. And, and then also then, I think Sam said it, engage our staff, ask them, what's their opinion? And Marion said that. People are happy now to give opinions. Go and ask them and they'll tell you. And then it's about listening to the information and then collectively come up with a strategy or a plan how to bring it back in the workplace. Yeah, can, I, can, I ask, can I ask a follow-up question of Peter? I think, um, I'm conscious of the fact that um, in a way in this discussion, almost no matter what the question is, the answer is around what managers and leaders in organisations need to be doing. And that, that's the unfortunate reality of being a leader, that actually you really are key to all of these things. And on the one hand, that's great because that means you, uh, you, know, you have a lot of potential to improve the mental health and well-being of the staff that you look after. On the other hand, it's a good, uh, you know, it is an additional burden for you to be having to do at the time when you too are trying to deal with all these same things with you and your job. Yeah. And, and I just wonder what, what we can be doing to assist the managers and leaders at this time from a practical point of view. Yes, excellent. So if I may, um, um, yes, my opinion, if you like, around this, and, and this is, I'm optimistic about the outcome. There's lots of positive things coming out of COVID lots of negative things, but some of the positives, the day of the, the hero leader, I think is over. The one individual on the white horse, I'm going to make the world better. Those days are hopefully gone. Well, the what new the hell leader, am I going to do now? Exactly. <laughs> well, no, no, there's hope. There's hope. You're going to have to learn to say thank you and please to your staff with a smile. So the more collaborative approach where we do need our people. So the more we communicate with them, ask for the input, it validate their, their, their feelings and concerns, but it also uh, their self-worth. So the psychology, you know, know more than me, the panel about this sort of stuff. But then the other part, actually, I'll use a practical example right now of a client of mine as a, a part of a leadership program. Um, because we quickly adapted the, the, the project this group is working on. So they have to deliver a practical project to add value or return on investment for this leadership program. So it's a merging leadership group. And I, I dispersed you know, all over the place. Anyway, long story short, so the project brief has changed, and I'll read to you, um, and the, the heading is, how do we effectively lead remotely through times of crisis? So here's the cohort, there's 22 people, they're emerging leaders in this organization, bright, young, up and coming, so, so they've been tasked with this project, and then I gave them a series of questions, like um, to go and talk to people in their respective Samsung projects, it's an engineering, global engineering firm, Samsung projects on mine sites, some work in the office, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And go and interview people back to your farm. And then what they're gonna be doing is uh, they're gonna present the findings of their research to the senior leadership team, the CEO and all the senior people in that organization. And this is the three topics that I've given them to present back on based on their research. One, I'll read it here. How does a leader manage a workforce that is both in the office and remote, right? The second one, the critical skills around inclusion, leading collaboration and challenging previous norms. And three, practical advice for how to manage a hybrid team. So, um, and I've already had some glimpses feedback from this cohort, but they already 
No, the feedback they've already, there's some gold nuggets of information. If I'm the CEO of that, CEO of that company, I'd be stomping at the bit to get access to this information. These, there's 22 people is now collectively gathered and so forth. So, so it will give them some, some information and intelligence of how to reset the way they run that business, how they lead, how they manage, what support's required for themselves, for the teams, etc. So I hope that sort of makes sense. But this to me is a, is a real-time example of how one organization is grabbing this unknown environment, but they're putting a little bit of, not science is probably the right word, but they're putting some intelligent brains to talk, listen, and then they're going to have a collective conversation around that. So there's one thing, Sam, that I think is good. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think that does need to be that example. You know, it's obviously an organizational response. And I think one of the, thing is, one of the things is if you're responsible or partially responsible for the health and well-being of an organization, I think one of the risks at the moment is that you are so absorbed with trying to sort out remote working and ergonomic assessments in people's home office and all of that, that, you know, the thing that can't slip through the net is I think every organization needs to be going out to their middle and senior leaders and saying, actually, you're probably really struggling at the moment. And what can we be doing to better support you? And like, it's not a question of are you struggling? It's we yes. know you must be struggling at the moment. So let's talk about what we can be doing to support you. And I think that's yeah. an example of an organizational response that has to happen from the very top. And yeah. I, I'm just mindful of time. And um, someone had just asked Peter if you might be able to share some of what you were reading from there when we developed the fact sheet. But I guess also in terms of leaders, it sounds like you know, we're all going through this together. So that sort of working with other people in similar situations and brainstorming ideas. But I also think that sense of self-care and tuning into yourself and noticing, you know, how am I going with this? What changes am I noticing? And what can I do to try and help myself in this time? So look, it's been fantastic hearing from the panel. It's been wonderful getting your sort of live input through the chat. We've tried to address everything that we can, but this is the beginning of a series of webinars. So we'll certainly be gathering ideas about future topics. But just before we leave, I'd just like to um, share with you some resources that you might find helpful that have come out of our discussions. And we'll also link you up with some other resources. So we would encourage you to check out our workplace education page on our website and sign up for our COVID-19 email, which gives you a weekly update of all sort of new targeted resources. But also have a look at the Heads Up website to access free evidence-based resources for businesses, managers and employees. And if you're after specific resources for mental health to support yourself or your team, we'd recommend looking into your employee assistance program, but also looking at free online treatment programs, including My Compass and This Way Up. There's a lot of evidence behind those and they're very accessible and user-friendly. And also um, the Black Dog Institute Clinic. So can I just say that online clinic, just um, that's, a, that's a relatively new part of our website where where anyone can go totally anonymously, answer a series of questions around the type of symptoms that they're having, and then they get a mental health report that they can choose to either print out and take to their GP as a starting point of the conversation, or it also gives them advice on a whole range of free online resources that are tailored for their particular symptoms. So it's, it's meant to be an easy gateway into people starting to get a bit of extra help. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. And I'd like to thank our panel, Sam, Marion and Peter, for the rich conversation and the useful insights. Please join us in two weeks for the second part of this series around building your team's resilience to cope with change and uncertainty. Um, please stay with us um, until I end the meeting because there'll be a, a quick pop-up survey for you to complete and we'd really love to hear your feedback around what you found helpful. Let's continue to work together during this challenging time and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you very much and bye-bye.